In May 2016, 20-year-old Michael Sanford's parents reported that he had gone missing in America. 23 days later, he turned up at a Donald Trump campaign rally in Las Vegas. I will build a great, great wall. Shortly after Trump took to the stage, Michael approached a police officer. Seconds later, he attempted to grab the officer's gun. When questioned by the Secret Service, Michael stated he'd wanted to shoot and kill Trump, saying he was a racist that deserved to die. But how did a young British man from Surrey end up trying to assassinate the most controversial and high-profile man in the world? Donald J. Trump. We've always just been a very, very close family unit. He thought Donald Trump was the worst thing for the world. This is not a hardened criminal. This is just a young kid who found himself in an awful situation. He tried to assassinate him. He was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Michael is due to be sentenced and could face decades in prison. Michael Sanford could have altered the course of American history. But were these the actions of a boy with a history of mental health problems? He seemed just a totally different personality from the boy I'd known. You know, he's going to spend his 21st birthday in prison, someone who really shouldn't be there. Or was it a premeditated attack? When Michael was shooting, he was doing this. Who's he working for? Maybe he got radicalized. There's nothing I can tell him that will make his situation any better. And I just want my son back. I'm telling you that if violence is wrong, I disagree with that. Call is from an inmate facility. Yeah, hi, son. Hey. So, what have you been up to today so far? Just up to myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What have you had to eat today? Uh, just potatoes. <clears throat> so, um, was porridge not on, not for breakfast today? I dropped it everywhere. Oh, <laughs> that wasn't very clever, was it? No. Is that because you were shaking? Yeah. Oh. Have you had any more seizures? I have a few, yeah. Mm. Oh dear, sorry to hear that. It's very hard to know that he's there and we're so far away from him. All the calls are recorded and monitored. It's very impersonal. Sometimes he begs me not to go and he rings me back again. He says, I just want to keep hearing your voice, Mum. I know we're down to our last minute, aren't we? So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I love you very much. I love you, Mum, <clears throat> and miss you. Yeah, you too, son. So, uh, anyway, take care, look after yourself. and yeah, You too, uh, take care, I love you so much. Yeah, I hope yeah. you managed to get something else to eat today. Thank you. I love you, Mum. Yeah, I love you, you too, too, darling. And Jessica does, and Nan does, and Dad does, and Where's Mischief Charlie does. <clears throat> Got cut off, you say, 15 minutes, that's all you get. Huh? I feel weary. Um, it's just the same every day, a phone call. I ask him what he's done, and the answers are always the same, what he's had to eat. You know, it's... Not a life, it's barely an existence for him out there at the moment. Just knowing that he's where he is, 
I'm powerless to do anything about it is impossibly hard. Michael's currently being held in a maximum security prison in Nevada's Death Valley while he awaits sentencing. After admitting trying to kill Trump, he's entered a plea bargain in a bid to reduce his sentence, but still faces the possibility of a lengthy jail term. This is one of the most high profile cases I've dealt with and certainly it's a very complex case. The government will be arguing that this was not something that was a spur of the moment type of crime. This was something that he had been, uh, that had been calculated. They're going to be arguing that this was in fact a very dangerous situation and could have resulted in, in somebody being murdered. The maximum under the law is 20 years for Michael, so he could be looking at many, many years in prison. Before moving to America, Michael lived in Surrey with his mum and half-sister Jessica. I think that one's really cute. <laughs> Probably his first ever smile. None of us had any idea what was ahead for us back then. You know, I sit and I look at these pictures of him as an angelic little boy. I just think it's so tragic that this is where his life is at, especially someone who really shouldn't be there. <laughs> He was very bright and bubbly and cute and sweet and adorable. He was the apple of our eye. Bunny. You're doing a bunny? Oh, you're doing a happy smiley face. But I think we first noticed that there might be problems when he was two. He would become quite hysterical when we would throw quite ordinary things in the rubbish bin. That was the first sign that he had some form of OCD. This, <laughs> oddly enough, his key collection. <laughs> he enjoyed collecting keys. When Michael was about eight, his moods started to change. They were quite erratic at times. He seemed to become quite depressive and quite angry. Hello. 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 I wondered if, um, because by then I'd split up with his father, I wondered if it was some anger at the, the breakup. But his, his mood swings and erratic nature were starting to concern me by then. Ooh. It says, Michael Sanford, my autobiography, age 13. It goes to all the usual things. My name is Michael Sanford, I'm 13. I live in Dorking with my mother, Budgie and Hamster. This bit is pretty sad. Um, I'm wondering what the world is coming to. They say the world will end when the sun blows up in five billion years, but I believe humans will destroy it long before then. That was something he was very worried about. He was very worried about mankind. I guess that's been mirrored by what he said about Donald Trump. He thought Donald Trump was the worst thing for the world. When Michael was 13, he was diagnosed with Asperger's, a condition associated with difficulties in social interaction. He was just falling apart. He was losing his grip on the world, not knowing how to fit in or cope. At secondary school, he was bullied. He deliberately tried to run out in front of cars sometimes, so that in the hope he would get knocked over to avoid going to school. I very much feel the system failed Michael. I took him for help so many times over so many years and nobody did anything until it became almost too late. Aged 14, Michael developed severe anorexia as a result of his OCD and had to be sectioned to a psychiatric hospital. He had said, you know, life isn't worth living. I find it too hard. I was really frightened that I was gonna lose him. I was terrified. Off you go. What are you drawing? A rainbow. Who's that for? 
Michael because I love him. He's very nice and good and he wasn't very well a long time ago and he did something wrong. So that's why he's in there now. Michael's parents separated when he was five years old, but he has always remained close to his dad, Paul. We all know our children, we all know their personalities. If you're honest with yourself, you know whether somebody has the potential to do something like that or not. He's never shouted, he's never screamed at me. That violent aspect of some kids and ages just wasn't there with Michael. Michael had never shown any interest in politics, at home or abroad. But Paul noticed a significant change when visiting him in prison following his arrest. He seemed very politicised, very radical, very logical, but very highly motivated about Mr Trump and the effect that he may have on the American people. Just a totally different personality from what I had, uh, the boy I'd known. Um, I've got a little box of his, all his memories here, so all things like the newspaper cuttings from before. Obviously, newspaper cuttings from now. Has he not told you why he did it, what was going through his head? No, I mean, it's very difficult for him to say anything to us. Everything he says and everything he does is monitored. He will tell us about it all, I hope, when he's back home, but at the moment he's not, he's not told us anything, really. I mean, I think, although it's quite a, a morbid thing to do, but when Michael comes out, um, I'm sure he's going to be quite interested in the news coverage from back home. Why do you think he did it? The only thing I can possibly think of is he's been coerced, groomed, whatever word you'd like to use. I mean, whether it was a structured group or whether it was just a few people with a political agenda to kill Donald Trump, I don't know. Asperger's can make you look at things in a very black and white. I think they saw Michael and saw he was vulnerable. Um, I think they saw a way to coerce him into what they wanted him to, him to do. I think whoever he was with um, has given him ideas because he wasn't my Michael. Aged 18, Michael told his parents he was planning to move to America to be with a girlfriend he'd met online. He just wanted to spread his wings, have a bit of independence and attempt to lead a normal life. He said he had to go or he would attempt suicide again. He's 18, he's an adult. He's a vulnerable adult, but you can't stop him doing anything. Michael's family used inheritance money to pay for a year's rent on a flat in Hoboken, overlooking New York. He was the smallest, skinniest person I'd ever met, the most polite person that I'd ever met. Michael never mentioned any girl to me or friends or anybody. As a matter of fact, I think I recall him saying he knew nobody here. If Michael moved to Hoboken for other reasons, I, I don't know. It does make you start to wonder. Initially, we heard from Michael all the time, but his behaviour became erratic. Sometimes we'd hear from him, sometimes we wouldn't. He turned very nasty at one point. He said to me, You've no idea how much I hate, loathe and despise you. And that was the final straw for me. I said to him, who, who is putting these thoughts in your mind? Because he'd always been so loving. On the 26th of May, 2016, having lost all contact with Michael, Lynn reported him missing to the authorities. I was worried out my mind. 
I could only see it ending in a disaster. During this period, police now believe he'd been living out of a BMW, bought using the money he'd been given for rent. Michael didn't surface again until the day of his arrest. Our headlines this morning. Donald Trump is celebrating his astonishing victory. Five weeks before Michael is due to be sentenced, Donald Trump's remarkable rise to the White House is confirmed. The Republican businessman defeated his Democratic rival, scoring Our decisive victories. confounded the pollsters and media pundits who predicted so what was the rest of the world make of these seismic events uh, that took place overnight uh, in America. We're going to get the view from London, Europe. I was up all night watching the results. Um, it's obviously only been announced in the last hour or so. There's no getting away from it now. I mean, he is going to be president for the next four years, and like it or lump it, you know, we've got to get on with it. It's a result that could have an impact on the length of Michael's jail term. We have sentencing coming up next month, and whether Donald Trump will choose to make an example of Michael remains to be seen. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. You know, he was looking forward to sentencing and hoping that there might be a favourable outcome, but I think this result casts a potentially very big shadow over that. Now it's time. For America to bind the I'm very worried that he will either lose his mind completely or commit suicide if he had the opportunity. It just made everything so much harder and so much more complicated for, for Michael. For those who have chosen not to support me in the past, of which there were a few people, I feel powerless. You know, I want to be able to to keep him strong and to give him hope. But a lot of that hope was dashed last night with the outcome of this, you know, and it's made the future so much more uncertain for him. ...political experience and one who's just caused the biggest political upset in American history. Michael is being kept in solitary confinement and gets most of his news from his mum. Have you heard about the election results? No, not yet. You haven't? OK, well, Donald Trump did get in in the end. So... Well, I guess I'm happy for him and it's America's choice, so I guess I have to respect that. I realise, you know, in many ways a bad situation just got worse for you, but... Um, yeah, I think it did. But you do understand that what you attempted to do wasn't right, don't you? Oh, of course, absolutely. I don't know if you no, oh, I know that, Michael, I know that. You have one minute remaining. Michael has now reverted back to being the loving son he always has. He sent us letters and cards um, and drawings that he's done. And every time he says, I love you, I love you, I miss you, I need you. Tears are streaming down my face as I write this. I miss you all, and I love you all more than words can explain. I'm so alone, cold, and scared here. I feel awful about the way I've treated you all. Mum, I'll be the son that you deserve. I'm so scared. I need you all. When Michael did move out to America, I redecorated my bedroom. Just kept me uh, thinking about him a bit more, I guess. Paul is flying out to meet Lynn in Las Vegas ahead of Michael's sentencing. It's been probably 10 years since I'd been abroad. He needs that support, and with that support, he'll be all right. Michael's mental health has deteriorated since Trump was confirmed as the president-elect and he's been placed on suicide watch. He's become quite depressed, and now I think he just wants to get the sentencing over and done with, so at least he'll know what's happening to him. We hope it's going to be OK. We hope they're going to take into account Michael's conditions, but we have been told that it's 
not something the American system really tends to um, look into. But he is flesh and blood, he is my boy. And uh, he's lonely and scared. I mean, he's got no family out there, he's got nobody to see him. He's in a prison where there are lifers who support Trump. They've got nothing to lose, really. I still lie awake at night a lot of times expecting that phone call saying there's been an incident, something's happened in the detention centre. <laughs> be honest, I'm really worried somebody's going to try and kill him. I really am. I've started on sleeping pills and antidepressants because there's been a number of nights where I haven't slept for two or three nights in a row and uh, obviously then you start to get really down tired. I've got to do it for Michael. You just get over it and get it done with. I'm trying to get my son home. With Michael's sentencing just days away, his legal team are putting the final touches to their case. So we put together, I asked Lynn to send me a bunch of pictures. So we need to call the court later on to make sure that we can play these while uh, we're arguing for sentencing. You know, the problem is the control we have over what happens to him when he's in prison is fairly minimal, but the control we do have is to limit the amount of time that he needs to spend there. Michael's plea bargain means he's pleaded guilty to impeding and disrupting government business and being an illegal alien in possession of a firearm. The reality is that you have Michael admitting that he tried to assassinate what is now President-elect Trump. He could face up to 20 years in jail unless his defense team are successful in proving he was suffering from a psychotic episode. And frankly, I don't think that that was Michael Sanford. That's not the Michael that I've certainly have come to know in the last few months. But uh, that's certainly the Michael that the government's going to be portraying at sentencing. Um, I think that Michael has suffered from a variety of different mental health conditions. And uh, what he said and what he did was really not uh, him, but a, a condition that needs to be treated. The arguments are ready. Everything's been filed. So I think right now it's just really a matter of just to wait and see. On his arrest, the Secret Service conducted a thorough investigation, tracking Michael's movements leading up to his assassination attempt. In the boot of his car, detectives found a used target that led them to a firing range less than a mile from where the rally took place. It's gonna be really loud. That's why we're gonna wear all your protection. Michael attended the shooting range the day before the rally. He would later tell detectives that he'd considered buying a rifle to shoot Trump from long distance, but claimed he was unable to acquire one. This is the Glock 17, the one that Michael shot. We're gonna load it, enter the magazine, and then we're just gonna slide goes forward, ready to go. Josh was the range safety officer that attended to Michael. Honestly, there was nothing off of him when he came in. He shot 20 rounds. He was shy. He was nervous, just like any other customer. But I would have never thought that he was practicing for an assassination ever. Glock 17s are standard issue for law enforcement here in this country. An experienced shooter, they don't anticipate the rounds. You don't shoot down. You're pretty much just keeping that gun forward which will look something like this. You're forward. When Michael was shooting, I'll see if I could get it right. I'm gonna miss on purpose. He was doing this. He was shooting the ground. He was not a good shot, of course, just like any other shooter who has never shot and has adrenaline kick in it and is really nervous. They usually shoot really low because you're flinching, you're so nervous. He was an ordinary customer. He seemed like a good kid, actually, you know, he just looked it's like he had innocence in him, just, you know, like he couldn't hurt a fly or anything. He seemed like a really nice guy, you know?
After a 10-hour flight, Paul has arrived in Las Vegas for Michael's sentencing. He is meeting Lynn and the rest of Michael's family at the airport. Quite nervous about everything now, and I can feel myself getting more and more nervous the longer I've been here, and I'm sure Lynn's going to be the same. The nerves will start when she gets in, and then I think as the day progresses, thinking about tomorrow, it's going to be hard for both of us, and I think Lynn, Lynn is going to start struggling. What's your relationship like with Lynn? Lynn and I get on really well. We always have done. Hello, Jessie. Hello. Even when we split up, we, we got on quite well. Hello. That's one of the things with the issues you get with Michael. It does bring you close together. You haven't got the choice. Hi, Paul. Right. Oh, yeah. You've got to be there for Michael. You've got to work together for Michael. Car's out this way. It's level one, the car park okay. at the back. So, Right. Come on, then. There we go. One big family, Jessica, hey? That's where it all happened, Treasure Island. So how you been then, all right? Yeah, yeah, it's been hard. You know, really, really tiring and stressful. Sleeping any bad? No, no, nor eating better. At least we'll have some sort of closure for tomorrow, won't we? It's been a long time coming, hasn't it? Uh, you know, and I know it's been weighing hard on, on Michael, you know, just the waiting and not knowing. Jessica, do you remember where I said that we're going to go tomorrow? <laughs> court. That's right, yeah. Who's going to be at the court and why are we there? Michael. Stay there again. That's right, yeah. So there's going to be a special person. The judge. The judge, that's right. And he, he's going to listen to lots of things about Michael and decide how much longer Michael has to stay here, isn't he? I'm a bit, a, a bit nervous off the trash because I've never seen him before. No. Do you think you can be on your best behaviour? Yes. And of course, Michael would like to see how well you can behave as well, wouldn't he? What would you like to say to Michael if you get the chance? I love you. Oh. <clears throat> you right? You right? Yeah. Hiya, son. How are you? Right, I think I just spoke to Granda. OK, did you? Um, what did she have to say? Um, just that I will be allowed to make a statement in court. Yeah, well, at least you get to have your say anyway. Are you going to read it to you me? You want me to read it to you? Hmm. Yeah, that'd be yeah, nice. You want me to read it to you? Yes, please. I would like to take this opportunity to apologise to everyone involved. I feel terrible and awful about what I did, and I'm extremely ashamed of myself. I am not a violent person, and I do not wish to harm or hurt anyone. Right, now when we get in, it's bed for you, Jessica. I deserve to be in prison for the rest of my life. However, I would like to ask for mercy as my bad mental health was a reason for me committing this crime. I would like to be able to go home so I can be with my family and get the treatment I need. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should say, though, that oh, you deserve to be in prison for the rest of your life, because that's not I, true. I mean... I did try and kill a guy like that. No, I know, but you didn't mean to and you didn't intend to, did you? And All right, I think you know. If the judge is swayed, which he shouldn't be, by the fact that Donald Trump is now the president-elect, then obviously he can, you know, give whatever sentence he chooses. But I just hope that he will see Michael for who he is, the troubled young man that just made a massive error and give him the second chance that he needs and deserves and give him, hopefully, the lower sentence. And do you think that will happen? 50-50. Really, those are the chances, you think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you prepared yourself for the worst? Um, 
I think I have, but, you know, just hearing it, you know, is an entirely different ball game. You can prepare yourself for these things, but until you're actually faced with them, nobody knows how you're going to react. And I've tried to prepare Michael, but I know the same thing again. You know, he's been just finding a way through to cope with each day, and that is thinking that the judge will will let him off with time served. Um, and how he's going to cope with the realisation, perhaps that that's not the case, is just going to be tremendously difficult. Just before midnight, nine hours before the rally was due to start, Michael made his way to the Treasure Island Casino and took fourth place in the queue. Greg Donovan, a staunch Trump supporter, was next in line. I asked this young man, I said, would you mind holding my space while I go change? He said, oh yeah. And I heard the British accent, I remember. I was in my full red thing and black top hat. But when he saw it, he seemed kind of repulsed. And I found that odd because I thought he would like it, you know. I just didn't seem like a regular Trump supporter. It didn't seem like that. That was my feeling. I was in fifth row, I got very close to Mr. Trump. I'm so close to him, look at that. There's something about the rallies. It's just euphoria. Ladies and gentlemen, the next president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. As the auditorium began to fill up, Cole Bartiromo, another Trump fan, took his place in the crowd. Crowds are just so high energy, feeding off his energy. So passionate, start chanting things over and over again. Thank you very much, oh, I love you people. I love Las Vegas. I love this state. 30 seconds into Trump's speech, with all eyes on the stage, Michael approached a Metropolitan Patrol officer. And borders generally that are strong and powerful. We're gonna get rid of Common Core and we're gonna bring our education local. When we get 37 states, uh, we love our police. Thank you, thank you, officers. I started filming when I saw guards tackling somebody. They're just dragging him out of there like he's a rag doll. Thank you, thank you, officers. It's like, whoa, like, what did he do? There is this anger. because Michael Sanford could have altered the course of American history. Thank you. He didn't look like a murderer. He was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Maybe he got radicalized. Somebody can come in here and they have the opportunity to kill our future president of the United States. That's very nice, thank you. I think you have to send a strong message, Donald Trump style. The judge has to give him the maximum. On his arrest, Michael told detectives that the greater good would be to lose his own life rather than have Trump as president. He stated that it wasn't a cry for help, only the right thing to do. You know what you did, right? Well, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, I can. You do, right? Yeah. Okay. It's the morning of Michael's sentencing. The family are on their way to meet the legal team for a final briefing. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Oh, remind me his name again. Timmy. Timmy. And the other one is? Tiggles. Tiggles. Yeah. Hello. How are you, Brenda? I'm good. Hi, Lynn. Good Hi. to see you. Hi. 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 Good to good see, to see you. you. When you see Michael coming into the courtroom, I just don't want you to be surprised. He's going to be shackled, right? So he's going to have handcuffs and he's going to have some leg cuffs as well. The leg cuffs are going to remain on him and you'll be wearing, you know, like a detainee garb, jumpsuit of sorts. Um, so I just don't want you to be shocked by that. So that's how you're going to see Michael. Judges do these differently, but they'll often hear from both sides and sometimes they'll ask questions. And then the judge will, will often ask the defendant to speak, Michael. Yeah. So, so we, we, we would plan on having, having him talk to the judge. And at the conclusion of this hearing, we will know the judge will actually announce what Michael's sentence is. And he'll give the reasoning as to why he decided to impose a particular sentencing. So um, we're hoping for the best, but of course we don't know what's going to happen. He can ultimately impose you know, the sentence that he believes is fair and just. Unless the Republican judge is sympathetic to Michael's mental health disorders, he faces a lengthy jail term. Michael Sanford is in there now, dressed in an orange jumpsuit. He is tethered at the ankles. Last big building. His family say that uh, he is um, someone who's had a lifetime of mental health issues and therefore they're, they're asking the court to show some leniency. <laughs> that is now in the hands of the judge and we're expecting that verdict at some time in the next hour. What's done is done. We can't change what happened. But my worries are that we won't get him back. Which way are we going? I think it's just round here, Jessica. Have you been able to talk with him? He needs to get psychiatric care. He needs to be back in the UK. I don't for one minute think Michael would be in the position he's in now if he had got the intervention he needed soon enough. Where's all the hate come from? I asked for help so many times, but I didn't get it. No, I understand that. Do you think what you're doing is right? It's uh, just a It's not. If you want to kill somebody, it makes you wrong. That makes you wrong. This is America, land of the free, right? Everybody should be able to entitle what they want to say and do, right? Well, I mean, with no. Yeah, no, everyone is entitled. This is America. That's the rule. That's no, when someone's right. Everyone's entitled to say what they want to say. Freedom that of speech. Doesn't mean it's right, though. If someone's okay, racist, well, you know what? They need to change the Constitution. How would you use the racism? I'm not here to debate. I'm telling you that it's, violence is wrong. I disagree with that. There is life for him, the other side of this. Whenever that may be, I know that although he attempted to do a bad thing, he's not a bad person. And I know we have to get him back. So can I ask you, Michael, just tell us about, uh, about this sentencing, what did you think? The judge recognized that the unique circumstances justified a sentence below the usual sentencing guidelines. The important thing is he wants to go home. He wants to go home as soon as he can. And, you know, the light is at the end of the tunnel here, so he, he's happy about that. The prosecution argued that Michael, by his own admission, had planned to carry out the attack for over a year. But the judge was sympathetic to his mental health 
and handed down a shorter than expected sentence of 12 months and a day. Is it good to see Michael? <laughs> he was so frightened in court. You know, he was shaking really badly. Um, he was choked when he spoke to the judge, he was breaking down. And um, I just feel like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders. You know, all the uncertainty and worry of the last few months. And now to know that it's such a relatively short time still to go before we get him back is just, you know, just bubbling with joy inside. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen you smile. <laughs> I haven't had a lot to smile about for quite a long time. He apologised to the judge for what he had done. He apologised to the judge for wasting people's time. And the judge turned around and said, you've got nothing to be sorry for. Um, he said, you've got, you've got a condition. If it had been a heart condition, he would take medication for it. And nobody would think anything about it. Hi. He said, it's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm just so ashamed at what I did and I just feel awful about it, I really do. It could have been far worse. So I guess I just have to be grateful that it is how it is and no one got hurt. Just hope to be able to, to get treatment for the mental health issues I have and to just continue with regular normal life. <laughs>